Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of La Rouge Rugby Podcast, where we talk about real Canadian rugby. I'm Shu Hardy, joined as always by Derek Brissett. Derek, we've had the final round of WXV action. Um, all three stages of the tournament have now come to an end. Um, we have in BC, we had the USA versus Ireland. Uh, we had New Zealand versus France, but the curtain call went to host Canada versus England. Effectively, the two best teams in the world um, in no, women's no, rugby. They are the two best teams in the world. That's not yeah. no No extra adjectives needed. They're just mm. straight up the two best teams in the world. Yeah, best in the world taking place in BC. Um, and New know. Zealand gets the free. We have we're the current World Cup champions argument that they can. Yeah, there. yeah that, that they have that for another year at this rate, and then they've got to back it up before um, they lose it to Canada. Let's go. Uh, <laughs> um, but let's talk about those other two games first. We'll just go into the score, you know, USA. Ireland obviously coming in off the loss to Canada, but still buoyed by the win against New Zealand. USA, um, you know, pretty rough go of it. First up, uh, up against England, and then they had to play France. And now they had to go up against Ireland, who are just on a huge resurgence. Yeah. Um, and it went as you would expect. Uh, the USA um, scoring only 14 to Ireland's 26. Um giving Ireland the bonus point win, putting them on 10 points. And then, and that was on the Friday night. So on the Saturday before the Canada England game, we had New Zealand versus France, which is again, a, you know, a close um, uh, fixture in terms of rankings. This is like third and fourth in the world against each other. You know, the World Cup semi-final um, had that narrow game, which was decided basically by a missed kick between New Zealand and France. Um, this one was a bit more one-sided. Final score, New Zealand 39, France 14. Um, so deciding on those two teams who have, you know, admittedly had a less than stellar WXV, I think. I know New Zealand with a loss to Ireland, France with a loss to Canada as well. You know, it's all, it's all coming back to BC place really at this point. Um, but, you know, I'm... I've dragged it on long enough. Let's talk about Canada, England. Um, so going into this game, what were your initial like predictions? Well, I think, I, I mean, I think going into this game, it's just, it's kind of like, I, like the WXV is like, in my opinion, it is still like, it's still a new creation, right? Yeah. Um. So it's, it's interesting to kind of see how, it, it plays out how it stacks up, how much it means to the players. But mm. I think ultimately going into this game, you have to kind of look at this as like kind of like a benchmark game for where you are as both teams are looking at. Well, both teams kind of are looking at obviously the 2025 World Cup. Um, there's a the World Cup draw is taking place this week, right? So it's like, the World Cup is on people's mind. It's only it's only a year out, right? It's a much shorter World Cup cycle because the previous tournament had to get pushed back um, mm. because of COVID, which I realized this week when I was kind of thinking, it's like, man, I feel like the World Cup just happened. It's because it did just happen. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's very close. Um, so yeah, like, right. So I think I think for every for not even just Canada and England, but like. The the entire WXV tournament kind of seems like a little bit of like a kind of like a benchmark um, tournament here to kind of see like where are you at um, mm. in the in comparison to the rest of the world and you know I think like for for New Zealand a team like New Zealand they're probably disappointed in like you know the loss losing to Ireland losing to England as well right so it's like they're probably looking at it okay like if we want to defend our title we we got some work to do. Right. Um, Canada, and England, I think going into this tournament, as you said, right, it's no, world number one versus world number two. Right. The you know, when they didn't play at the World Cup, it was the best game of the World Cup. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, it was both teams were immense. And um, I don't think, you know, I don't really think a whole lot has changed in the last like couple of years. I think England, Canada, New Zealand, I think are your clear top three. Right. And mm -hmm. 
Canada beat New Zealand earlier this year, right? Yeah. Um, the Pacific Four. So it's like I think the the one the kind of the one remaining team for Canada right now, I think, is seeing how you stack up against England, right? And I think going into this going into this game, it's like I think that's kind of the focus is to kind of find out like where you're at a year out. And I think ultimately the result of this game kind of indicates that you know what, like the, they're pretty close. But yeah. you want to win. I think if Canada wants to win the World Cup, and yes, I know they were without Sophie de Goody, they were without Chrissy Skirfield. It's not necessarily the best roster Canada can put forward, right? Mm-hmm. Hopefully, you get the. I mean, hopefully, you get everybody's healthy by the time the World Cup comes around, right? Yeah. Uh, but I think this game does ultimately show it's like they're close, but they do need to find another gear, um, in order yeah. to. Win. And similarly. For England, I think, is kind of the opposite of that, where it's like England, I think, going into the World Cup next year is going to be in a very interesting position because I think Mm -hmm. they have, like, all the pressure. And I think you can kind of see it in this game a little bit, too, where it's like England is the best team in the world, right? They had that that post came out that they have – they hit the highest world ranking points in history right? yeah. for women's, right? Like, they're the best team in the world. They're riding a 20, what is it? Tw- now that they beat Canada, spoiler, I guess, but like, yeah, riding like a, what, 21, 22 game winning streak now, whatever that is. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they'll, they are go- that was the 20th victory in a row. Yeah, 20 game um, winning. Yeah, so um, that, but this is something that someone pointed out is that um Canada so not Canada England um yeah. cannot get any points in the six in sorry they can't get any world ranking points in the six nations because the only um because you know if it's going to be a continuation of the past couple of years they're going to get the grand slam again they're going to win every single game and the only teams that have been shown to have you know any real threat are the teams that are in the um, top four, which would be England, who can't play themselves, New Zealand, aren't in the Six Nations, Canada, aren't in the Six Nations, and France. Well, they're playing France in England, so they have home advantage, so that means that they cannot gain any point. The only way England can win games and get world ranking points is if they play France in a you know pre world cup friendly fixture in france or they play canada either in canada which is unlikely at this point or on neutral ground which again could happen in a world cup warm up fixture the interesting thing is that because the world cup is held in england england have home advantage for all those games yeah. so they could potentially win every single game next year and not gain a single world ranking point. And like, so I think that is actually the very interesting thing with England. And it was going to tie, and it ties in nicely to uh, what I started talking about there. But like England is on a 20 game win streak. Like you said, they've, I guess, based on their schedule, they've essentially maxed out on world cup points based on what you just said there. Right. Hmm. Um. So, but the fun thing about the 20 game win streak is that the only thing preventing that from being a 50 game winning streak is Mm. World Cup final. Um, They lost to New Zealand, right? So, I mean, they've lost. um, I can't remember what that got to, but for sake of argument, let's say they, their last 51 games, I should have looked this up before, but for whatever it is, right in their last 51 games, they're 50 and one. The one is the most important one though. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think if you're looking, um, I think if you're England, you got to be going a year ahead. It's like it doesn't like world like st- world ranking standing points. Who cares? The Six Nation. Who cares? Right. Like you're gonna run mm. through those. It's like the only thing that this team has left to do is win a World Cup, and it's on home soil. Like yeah. all the pressure, all the pressure's on them. Right. And it's like yeah. And I, I think this kind of, I think this game, we'll talk, we'll talk details about the game, but I think this game kind of solidified it, right? Like they, they're the clear favorites. Mm-hmm. They, you know, beat Canada by, um, by nine, nine points, 
right? Wasn't exactly a dominant victory, but it's, you know, but a win's a win. It's a concise victory, right? And it's, um, and like, I, I think like if you're using this game as a benchmark, I think Canada is looking at it's like, okay, we need to raise our game and pick, we need to step up another level, find another gear in over the next year in order to beat England when it comes time for this world cup. And I think if you're England, it's like, you probably also want to find another gear, but Mm -hmm. like everyone's gunning for you here. It's on your own turf. You're the best team in the world. The only game you've lost in the last, what, five years was the previous World Cup final. Mm-hmm. Right? It's like you've done, they've done everything except win the thing that matters the most. Right. So yeah. it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to kind of see how the, uh, how the year kind of plays out based on that. Cause I think, you know, winning the WXV again is, um, you know, it solidifies them as the best team in the world, but they, they have one, their one loss is a very glaring omission on this on this quite frankly legendary team's resume right now. So yeah. I think it's well, a good benchmark game. And it ended up being a good benchmark game. Yeah. Um there's something I just want to point out, because you mentioned that um, you know, we were without um Sophie DeGoody and a number of Canadian, you know, starters at this point. Um, but the same could also be said for Eng- uh, England as well. Like Abby Dow was uh, out for this game due to a HIA. Um, but one, but the thing that I've been thinking about recently is maybe that's actually more reflective of a World Cup final because by the time you make it to the World Cup final, you would have played yeah. um, like five games already, you know, week after week and there's a very strong likelihood that a number of players have to or like a number of starting players are unavailable so maybe this was closer to a more accurate representation as well um i'll also say i read the bbc report on this game yeah and you know keep bringing up the fact that canadian players are amateur which is you know skew with because you know a handful of them are playing in um the Premiership Women's Rugby, another handful are playing with like professionally in like the seven circuit as well, and just coming into the 15 side when required. Um, so, but they pointed out that Canada are probably closer to their form in 2014 than ever. And of course, we remember that year was an England Canada uh, Women's World Cup final. So, yeah, I I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't be upset if that's the uh, fixture we get in uh, 2025 by all means. Yeah. I think I think I mean I think with that it's like for your first point one like injuries are a part of rugby and you know there's there's no there's no predicting like when they'll happen who they'll happen to how bad they'll be mm-hmm. right um so I mean yeah injuries are a part of rugby and you know both both teams were dealing with it in this game and uh yeah both every, every team at the world cup will likely be dealing with it at some point yeah it's gonna happen um but i mean i think looking at like you said the quality of players like um mm-hmm. you know Dow for england the goody for uh for canada like no even if you're you know in order to win a world cup you're gonna have to build up your depth but you, you want your best player in the lineup too and yeah that mm-hmm. you know especially for canada that sophie the goody is an omission from the squad is still notable um, and, but I think, I think too, like for the amateur, the amateur pro thing, and it's like, you know, obviously, you know, Sophie de Goody and Kevin Rue have been kind of, you know, hammering that nail since, uh, you know, the semifinal loss to England at the previous world mm. cup, right. Um, you know, more money, more resources, right. There are a lot of players that are playing in professional setups overseas. I guess there's a, there is a new pro league coming. Um, yeah. Those rosters look like yet, but there, there is a league coming in North America. We'll see how that goes. Their first season, I guess, mm-hmm. is to happen yeah. next year. Right. We'll see how that ends up working out. Hopefully it does. Right. Um, but I think ultimately though, like Canada's where they are without, necessarily being fully professional right so i think mm-hmm. like 
no matter what, like, yeah, it would be nice if there was maybe as, you know, some more money, some more resources to be put into the program, right? And I think every country probably thinks that too. But it's like, where can what Canada is still where they are with what they have, right? Mm. And I think like, if you are England, it's like, and I think watching this game, you kind of got to be like, yeah, like, they're like, they're knocking on the door of like, being that world number one, being a team that can, that may likely meet them in a World Cup final, or at the very least, if it's not in the final, depending on how that draw goes and how the pools look or whatever, mm -hmm. at the very least, you're going to have to beat them to win the World Cup. You're going to have to beat them at some point. Yeah, of course. So like, I think, and I think, like, whatever you want to make of the professionalism amateurism thing is like the fact of the matter remains is that England is the number one team. Canada is quite frankly, right behind them. Mm -hmm. right? So it's like, so no matter what the actual setups are, like Canada at least is on the pitch is making it work right now. It'd be nice to see some more benefits to, uh, to mm -hmm. the 15s team, but like, you know, like ultimately at the end of the day, like you, if you want to win the World Cup, you got to maybe you you will have to figure out how to win it with what you have. And right now, Canada, I think, is ultimately making what they have work very, very well. Mm. Again, it would be nice to get more. It'd be nice. Yeah, of course. But like the like, you know what I mean? Like, hey, if, yeah. if this is what Canada looks like as if the BBC are saying that they're amateur and this is what they look like, you should probably be terrified if, um, mm. well, if Rugby Canada ever figures their, figures their stuff out. But yeah, uh, yeah. like, because, yeah, like, they're the second best team in the world with, I don't even, I don't know, like, a significantly less resources than England, and they're still yeah. there with them. But, all right. So we actually, um, the game. Yeah, let's talk about the game itself. And I want to, first of all, compare this game with how the Canada Island game started because Canada Island, um, that game went 25 minutes or to 30 minutes before the first score. Yeah. This game went four minutes before the first score. I think that obviously, you know, that was the gauntlet being thrown down by Canada. It's like, you may be the best team in the world, but we're still going to score on you and we're going to score early and that was uh peltier getting over for the first try um tessier missed the conversion which i was worried was going to be a bigger factor come towards the end of the game obviously that Pretty didn't big. matter in the end but at the time and then england were obviously like anything you can do we can do better so in the ninth minute muro goes over for a try and roland and converts for that for 45 minutes yeah. That, and then nothing, so nothing, nothing at all. But at the same time, watching it, um, you know, same issues from Canada as the game against Ireland. There were opportunities that went missing. There was, you know, it seemed like there was a lack of communication between certain players. It feels as though Canada need to work on two things. And this is, you know, something that's also affected the men's side, which is being able to finish within the opposition 22 okay. and two is just bringing everything together. Cause there was times in this game when um, the ball was being frequently offloaded between Canadian players and it was exposing gaps yeah. in the English defense. And then one player would either offload the ball to the wrong person and that that person would get tackled and then it'd be a turnover or they were passing to a person who wasn't ready to have the ball yet because they weren't in position. But the mindset is offload the ball, keep the ball alive, go from there. And things just didn't gel. And that's when you have scrums. That's when you have penalties. And that was a bit of Canada's undoing. However, what Canada did incredibly well was expose England. So I'll put this into context. Ellie Kildun has scored two tries in both games leading up to this. Yeah. And then in this game, she was targeted. She was brought to ground. Like 
the first thing the players did, they didn't go for any high tackles. They went straight for the legs. They stopped her where she was. And yes, she did have a breakaway run in towards the end of the second half. That was the only highlight of her game. She was dropping the ball. She was making silly mistakes. She made a mistake so silly that she got a yellow card for it at the start of the second half, which eventually allowed Canada to score a try. Eventually. Yeah. And this and this is the same player that is regarded by many as like the player of the tournament. Ellie Kildun is phenomenal, but Canada made her look human. That was how impressive Canada were. They were able to spot the key makers in this English side and neutralize them. That is why the score was 5-7 for nearly 40 minutes. That was incredible to watch. And what and what's even more impressive is you know, England played Canada three times last year, once in the WXV, and they had uh, two friendlies beforehand. And Canada just were unable to stop England at any point. England just walked through them. You know, one of the games was 50 to 24. Um, but it really looks like Canada have done their homework on this England squad. And the, if any if any side needed like alarm bells ringing in their ear, it was England. This is a team that you know frequently puts multiple points on so many other teams like New Zealand, France, um, Ireland. As guess is now coming up into their own into this Canada, who they have refused to even humor especially considering like last year's results which were at least 20 points differential between each of the games they were all over them they couldn't do anything and yeah obviously we can discuss about you know if Canada had more resources maybe the end result would be different but it is what it is and what it is was this was an actual test for England. This was a challenge, which they were able to overcome. But for a big portion of this game, that wasn't always clear. That was how impressive Canada were in this game. Yeah, I, I think I think ultimately, I think that kind of comes back to what you brought up um, earlier in the in this episode was just like, you know, they basically like maxed out like their world ranking points and. Not that that really means anything, but it's kind of like England, I think, uh, where they are as the best in the world, they can improve, obviously. There's always going to be a little bit of room for improvement. Mm. But as it's kind of illustrated by the fact that like, they pretty much have maxed out world ranking points, right, is like you can improve, but the teams that are below you can probably get better faster than you at this point because mm. you have pretty much peaked like again like they've won essentially 50 of like what 50 of their last 51 games yeah and the one is the most important one but it's like mm -hmm. there's like england can still get better but there's not that much room for improvement whereas if you have a team like canada or even new zealand um usa ireland the teams that are below right below them that are you know gunning for them france as well right it's like they are still striving to reach your level Right. Mm -hmm. So it's like they can still get a lot better. And I think right now we're, we are kind of seeing a little bit of, I think, England, maybe not like I think there's still going to be like, like small improvements and stuff, but they're kind of like plateauing, whereas Canada still is still climbing that mountain. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think you do kind of see that. But I think also what this game shows, though, is still like the difference between a really good team and the best team in the world, I think yeah. on display in this game. Cause I think you look at, I, I think you kind of look at like the biggest situation in this game came in the second half, right? You mentioned it earlier, killed on who didn't have her best game, but didn't have her best game and got a yellow card um, for quite frankly, just a 
silly play. Like she mm. she knows better than to do that. Canadian fan, I'll take it. Um, mm. but like she knows better than that. Like that was kind of goofy. And England wasn't really in the worst position there. They were maybe in trouble, but they had like like their players were getting back. Like they were probably gonna be fine. Um yeah. but like I think the biggest thing is like you is just for Canada. And it's like, I think you see it in like the last World Cup as well. Going back to the last World Cup, right, was kind of like, you also, there is something to be said, I think, for just knowing how to win, right? Mm -hmm. Knowing how, like, when it is a tight game, to figure out what that little, like, extra 1% thing might be, right? To figure out how to come away with a win, right? And, like, what also is like what that means is a little bit of like that killer instinct needs to be there right and i feel mm -hmm. like for canada that was kind of missing and i think that that showed in this yellow card because canada gets the yellow card tessier kicks to the corner the line out which based on your two things that were kind of problematic that you thought in this game i would like to pr propose number three is line outs um mm -hmm. Right, because the lineout in this game was not good, right? And I think, and this was one of the moments where it let him down the most because this throw was not straight. England yeah. rocks. England then on the back of multiple lineout infractions from Canada, right? March go all the way up the field on the yellow, right, and end up like at Canada's five meter line. Now, you know, funny change of events. England screws up that lineout, right? Um, and then eventually, and then Canada tries to clear the ball. Tessier's kick doesn't reach touch. England brings it back in. And really, like, on that whole yellow card, it took Canada seven minutes before they got any, like, actual meaningful possession on that yellow card, right? And ultimately, we're able to, we're, did it, we're able to score. But if you take that and compound it with the fact that there was a second yellow card almost immediately after, I think three minutes after, Canada basically played 20 out of 23 minutes in the second half, right? Down, or a stretch of 20 out of 23 minutes, right? Up a player, right? Four, 15 on 14. And they came mm -hmm. out of it even, right? It was 7-7 seven, seven, because England scored a try during the second yellow, right? Mm -hmm. and in both cases... And other moments of the game, Canada had moments where they were five meters out, missed line out. As you said, the execution, the the execution, the ability to finish in the 22. And I'll sit like, yeah, like a little bit of the the killer instinct of this, right? Mm. To be like, okay, like we have a huge opportunity, right? We need to, right, especially for the second yellow, where it was like, okay, now now we're up 12 seven we're up by five right it's like here's the second yellow this game is really tight both teams are probably not scoring a lot of tries this second yellow is your chance to bury england yeah and they, they and they ended up that did not happen yeah it did, unfortunately it didn't happen but like coincidentally like on the other side of it is england is like okay like we're down we're down a player again right somehow get the ball into Canada's territory. And it's like, yeah, when they got the ball near inside their five meters, right? It's like every forward's hitting every ruck. The breakdown was flawless. They're executing at the highest level and they score a try for it, right? Puts them back up too. And now you, England's kind of now looking at, okay, we just played, like we're going in the final 10 minutes of the game. We just played the last 20 down a player, right? And we're still winning this game. Right. So now we're good. And we're still winning this game. So now let's go. And in the last 10 minutes, Canada didn't really have much of a sniff at anything. Right. Cause it was like England did what they need to do and go into like lockdown mode. Right. And like anything that Canada did try. Right. Again, a lot of like your own errors. Right. Just got mm -hmm. right, your own errors. Whereas England came out executed. And we're actually able to score a try, another try before the end of the game, which, you know, pushed it to a nine point win, which maybe isn't really like if you watch the game, it's not really a nine point difference between these two teams. But um, 
like it did feel it felt a lot closer to that 14 12 score that it nearly ended up being but like i think that's like and i think watching this game and being like knowing that it's a year out from the world cup like canada is obviously a really great team like you said they they're picking they their strategy going into this game was a lot better they you know they neutralized killed done right england's attack was was wasn't as lethal as it seems against other teams, right? They were able to neutralize that. They were good at the breakdown. The biggest miss, I think, was just like the line out, I feel like really let them down at certain big points in this game. And mm-hmm. just at at some point, I know it's it's a weird thing to say and it's kind of an intangible thing, but it's like you when you have that opportunity to like bury a team or to mm-hmm. pick up that insurance try. If, you, if you're playing a team like England, you're playing the number one team in the world and you don't take it, there's a big chance that that's going to come back to bite you later on. And it kind of did in this game, right? And I think, like, ultimately that's the difference between, like, good teams and great teams or even great teams and World Cup champions, right? It's like mm. you can find a way to do that. And it's yeah. so, so like when England lost that one game, it's like, yeah, New Zealand just dug deep found a way to beat them world cup champions now we just laugh at the fact that england doesn't have a 55 game winning streak or whatever that would be (laughs) yeah it it's one of the things that has been brought up a number of times of you know as you said sophie de goody has mentioned it and uh we've mentioned a number of times of like just having the resources to compete with a team like England or compete with England, uh, France and New Zealand regularly. I mean, but again, now now we're in the position where we are, but at the same time is that I feel like England at this moment in time are like the all blacks between 2012 and 2015 is that, you know, maybe there is a team out there that, can focus on one game and really push it and you know maybe be England. Yeah. But they're not going to win consistently. It's gonna be like a flash in the pan, like I a think- two point game. You know, part of me was hoping that this game would be decided by a last minute drop goal. But I think by the 77th minute when Canada kept conceding penalties and they kept moving closer to Canada's try line, I was like, all right, this is uh th- that ain't gonna happen. So I, I think it it's, is what it is. I think it's an interesting comparison that you brought up because I think like I mean for me, like I started like I started playing rugby when I was in grade nine, so that would have been around two thousand seven, right? So we didn't like, I don't know, I didn't, maybe didn't really start, like, really watching it to, like, 2009, 10, and going into that 2011 World Cup. Um, mm-hmm. And, yeah, like, what I remember from, like, that All Blacks era, um, because they were my favorite team when I actually got into rugby, was just, like, yeah, like, they, they felt unbeatable. Like, if yeah. you beat them, like, it was, like, like world news, right? Like, it's, mm-hmm. like, actually like leading up like oh my god like the all blacks lost um the mayans have predicted doomsday in 2012 it's all connected (laughs) right like and i feel like that's kind of how like what the all blacks were and i think and then obviously they won back-to-back world cups which totally solidified they won one of those without dan carter that's how good the all blacks were um Mm. but like i think the the biggest difference that i kind of feel with the all blacks and then like the uh, the red roses is well like one we did just as we've been talking about they did lose the world cup final right yeah. and it's like but and you watch games like this as well where it's like okay like they're gonna win but there's something about this team that also is like they are beatable right and it's mm-hmm. like they show and teams have proven that they are beatable i mean i think canada in this game canada i think can be looking a lot at themselves to being like, we need to execute on this play, this line out, like this, you know, phase of passing these offloads. There's a lot 
like there's a lot that you can look at and be like, if we execute here, maybe the score is different. But also I think you come back to, as we kind of said, the biggest one is like when it mattered the most, the red rose is lost. Mm. Right. Yeah. And you know, that I think is like also like, I know pro athletes and stuff. They'll like move on from like big losses and things, but there's like, I think if you can just, especially if you get to a big game on a big stage, and I think it's maybe almost happened here. If I think if you can put the seed of doubt into the red roses, then you might be on your way to something. Right. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, like a lot of the players on this team were on the team that lost the world cup final. Right. And it's like, there's yeah. a lot of players on the red roses that throughout their entire international rugby career have probably only lost one game. And it's the game that hurts the most to lose. Right. And it's like, I think, I think if you can play on that a little bit as an opposition team or whatever, especially if you get into say like a WXV, this was basically a final for all intents and purposes. Right. You yeah into that WXV final, maybe the Six Nations, certainly the next World Cup. It's like they, as good as they are, they're, I think they are beatable, which I guess is maybe a little bit different than how people maybe felt about the All Blacks back then. Yeah. What did they have, an undefeated season in 2013 too? Like, geez. Yeah, no, I think that was 2013. Yeah, like they could, uh, but like, I mean, England's had like what, how many of those, but they lost the one that matters the most. And that's the one that everyone remembers, right? Like, yeah, it's, it's a tough thing to kind of like overcome. But I think like, I think like you kind of said, like even in the semifinal against Canada, it was like, it took genuinely one of the greatest tries ever to beat Canada in that game. And yeah. I think, I think England is getting better still. But I think Canada's gotten a lot better since that game, right? So if they do end up meeting, like, when they meet at the World Cup, like, it will be fascinating. Yeah. I think, like, I think Canada can can beat England, right? And Yeah. And I, I, I agree with you. I think that they can absolutely. It's a matter of what England. do it, because I think. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I said earlier, it's like, it does, they're like, I think in sports, a lot of times it's like skills, um, skills, strategies, coaching, all of that. It, it can obviously, it can take you a lot of great places, but I think sometimes when it's like you get to the base, like the biggest stage, the biggest moments, mm -hmm. I think sometimes there is a little bit of like intangibility that comes with just being like able to like rise to that occasion yeah. and like elevate your game to a spot that maybe you previously didn't think you could ever actually get to, but when the moment warrants it, you got to be able to do it. Yeah. And, right. I think that's in this game. I'm kind of like, okay. Yeah. Like that's the step that Canada needs to take to be like, all right, like line out five meters away. Like mm. we're, we're cashing this in. Right. It's like, you know, it's like, hey, we got a huge line break on the corner. That pass is going to be the most accurate pass I have ever thrown in my life. Because, yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think Canada can find that gear. And mm -hmm. uh, when they do, England should be terrified. Yeah. I absolutely agree. You know, it all it takes is, as it's shown from England, one game that, can make all the difference mm -hmm. um and speaking of the world cup taking place in england next year um the pool will be drawn tomorrow now we are recording on wednesday the 16th of october so by the time this goes out canada's pool will be confirmed but while we're here now uh derek i'm going to just give you a task of who would you like canada to face now Canada will be drawn in pool one. That's uh, the pool containing England, New Zealand, Canada, and France, which means they will not be playing each other. They will then play in opposition from pool two, pool three, and pool four. That are decided on who has qualified and their world ranking positions. So, 
we have so Canada will not be facing England, New Zealand, or France in the pool stage at least. I have to wait till the um uh the elimination round or the final round. Um so pool two has Australia, Ireland, Scotland, and Italy. Now, considering that Canada is second in the world and first or fourth of we uh not gonna be playing each other until the finals. Uh, this will probably be like the biggest uh, challenge. So, who do you want Canada to face at a pool to? Australia, how, Ireland, Scotland, or Italy? How how am I doing this? Am I going like what what I think would be the best game, or is like the way to like set Canada up for success here? Uh, how am I? How am I well, maybe those two are both the same thing. Who who do you think will provide like the biggest challenge to Canada? Um, I think I think uh, based on the past uh the past WXV, I guess the biggest challenge would be Ireland, uh, mm -hmm. out of this group. Um, I think uh I think I would want them to play Italy, though. I feel like Canada does has some had some World Cup success against Italy. Yeah. Okay, so for my pick, I don't want Canada to face Australia. We have that already with the Pacific Four Series. Um, Italy and Canada are in the same pool at the last World Cup, so I don't want to have a repeat of that. So between Ireland and Scotland, well, you picked Ireland. I'll go with Scotland. You know, this is a fixture that we haven't really seen Canada have uh, recently, even with the WXV. So that'll be my pick. Canada and Scotland in their pool. Is it uh, weird, though, that it doesn't really feel like a World Cup until Canada plays Italy? So I feel like that happens every World Cup, men's and women's. Canada, Italy. Now that you mention it. A lot, all the time. I think I might have to go with Italy just because it's the only way this would feel real. As is tradition. Um, I'm just because I know they played in 20, uh, 21 or 22, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, they did not, they were not in the pool stage of, um, 2017 though. So, but yeah, it does feel like 2015, 2015, 2019. Yeah. The men's team. Let's not talk about 23. Um, all of them. yeah. Not all of them, but right. the last three that they've. All right. Okay. So let's look at pool three, which has the USA, Wales, Japan, USA. and South Africa. USA. You want you yeah. want to pick the USA? Put the rivalry game in. Yeah. USA immediately. Uh, you know, I kind of have like the same issue with like picking Australia. It's a fixture that we now have on like an annual basis. Also, oh. Canada and the USA had the um, weird thing because there was only 12 teams last time. And it was like Canada was second overall behind, um, I think, England. Mm -hmm. or, New or New Zealand in because of uh, bonus points and stuff like that. So their final pool game was against the USA and their quarterfinal was against the USA. So I, so we have you Wales, need, Japan. Need and, uh, um, you know I you need an easy win mixed into this, you know, USA. Well, well, wait till we get to pool four. Um, <laughs> I will, you know, red on red, I will go with Wales then in that regard. Um, you know, another another easy win. Another easy win, another six nations team. Um, I guess if I had to absolutely make a choice of, you know, I've already got one six nations team, you don't want to have another, I may then go for because uh, I think they played Japan at the last World Cup as well in the pool stage, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, so not if it can't be Japan and it uh, can't be Japan, can't be Wales, then it has to be uh, South Africa, which again would be an easy win regardless of the way you look at this. And then finally, I would like uh, to we congratulate you on picking all four teams in that pool. So that's yeah, um. <laughs> So, pool four, we have Spain, Samoa, Fiji, and Brazil. Uh, Fiji, they have the best jerseys. I like looking at their jerseys, so I'll watch a game that they play. Okay, you pick Fiji. I will... 
I think if I pick Brazil, that's just being mean because Brazil are the lowest ranked team of the entire tournament. I think um, it's got to be pool three and pool four, are like in their tw- are in like ranked twenties. Brazil, I believe, are ranked somewhere in the forties. Like they just because they have the uh, regional qualifier, so that's how they were able to get into this. But they didn't take part in the WXV in any regard. So that'll be fun. yeah. I you know if yeah you could pick the lowest ranked team. You know the team that's currently forty second yeah. in the world rankings. But that's just mean. That's just, I well, mean if if I'm, it's picked from the draw, that's fine because that's random. Me <laughs> saying I I want to pick Brazil. That's yeah. just cruel. That's just unfair. That's actually um. That's so, actually the best part of this segment is that by the time yeah. anybody's listening to it, it's completely irrelevant because they would have actually done this. Yeah. So I, you know, you picked a Pacific Nations team. I'll pick the other one. I'll pick Samoa. So your pool would be Canada, Ireland, USA, and Fiji. Mine would be Canada, Scotland, South Africa, and Samoa. And again, but- completely irrelevant because every completely irrelevant but we're doing this because it's fun we're doing this because we have less than 24 hours before it's irrelevant we're just having a bit of fun and you know we'll get to see and obviously not long after we have the pool draw we will get the schedule for games and Mm -hmm. where and when they will be played in england um you know and regardless of who ends up in what group it's going to be a great tournament to watch but of course that's next year if you're looking to watch any rugby this weekend the premiership and urc is available on sportsnet and the premiership women's rugby will be taking place on the rugby network if you enjoyed this episode be sure to check out more as well as our written pieces on our website therougerugby.ca you can also find our podcast directly on spotify and apple podcasts We have our YouTube channel at LaRouge Rugby. Make sure to like and subscribe and hit bell notification to stay up to date with all our videos. You can also find us across social media, including Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and threads, all at LaRouge Rugby. Derek, where can people find you on social media? At Brissette the Jet across all social media networks. And you can find me across social media at Hardman, spelled H4RDMAN. Well, that's where we're going to end this episode. Derek, thank you for joining me. And thank you all for joining us for another episode of the Rouge Rugby Podcast, where we talk about real Canadian rugby. We hope you can join us again next time.